It's the only way to travel. Despite the crashes, you feel safe on a train. I mean, statistically, planes are as safe. But they're still much more scary, aren't they? On planes, you meet the language reality gap, the kind of cover-up of the truth, more than anywhere else. You get on a plane, and in the event of a crash, they give you airline safety instructions. Safety? Listen, planes are unlikely to crash, but if they do, safety has nothing to do with it. They should call them airline... There's bugger all we can do about this, but these might make you feel a bit better instructions. <laughs> safety? I mean, they get you to assume the crash position. They do. Sometimes you have to rehearse it. The crash position. Actually, it's a bit difficult to spread yourself across six fields when you're strapped into an airline seat. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what the crash position is. Head between the knees, right? That's what it is. Head between the knees. Now, what good is that? I mean, what's good is going to do when you're in a large metal tube filled with aviation fuel, hits the ground at 650 miles an hour? Nothing. Actually, here's a bit of advice, right? If you're in a couple, right, and you're about to crash, put your head between each other's knees. <laughs> you might as well make something out of your final mess. I cannot imagine any reason whatsoever why a person would want to put their head between their partner's legs. <laughs> Unless they're looking for a contact lens, I suppose. <laughs> crash position? I'll tell you what the crash position is. Mouth wide open, trousers filling rapidly. <laughs> Flying is terrifying. I was in New Zealand last time I, I, I flew into Wellington Harbour. Now, Wellington Harbour is surrounded by mountains, creating a natural wind tunnel, which coincidentally is exactly what it turned my trousers into. <laughs> the pilot says, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're experiencing a little turbulence. I thought, yeah, it's all coming out of my bum. <laughs> The man behind me's seat pocket was inflating in front of him. His in-flight magazine was being forced into his stomach. I don't know if you've ever been in a plane when it hits an air pocket. I mean, a plane just drops like a stone to the bottom of the pocket. Just drops like a stone. Your whole body seems to shoot out of itself and hit the ceiling. Scientists believe there is actually an optimum moment when you can trap on your own head. But again... Again, we cover our terror with words. Soothing words. Media type words. Everybody getting on the plane, they're all saying the same thing, saying, oh, we're much better off than if we were in a car, yes. We're much better off than if we were in a car. It's true! At 35,000 feet, you are better off in an aeroplane than in a car. Anywhere else, take a taxi. Yeah, I joined the Mile High Club, actually, but I was flying Virgin, so I just did it on my own. Fear makes us totally irrational. We lose all sense of reality when we're scared. I mean, one of the most common obsessions on planes is, is people get the idea that they have to concentrate on the fact of flying. It's very true. It's a very common obsession. They actually have to concentrate or else the plane won't stay up. It's true. It's like an act of faith. And if they relax, the magic won't work anymore. Gin and tonic, sir. Go away! I'm flying the plane! <laughs> we make of our fears what we will. Scared of demons, invisible ideas. Late at night, you're in bed. You hear the central heating gurgle. Now, you know it's the central heating. But by the time it reaches your brain, it's turned into the creeping tread of a homicidal maniac. <laughs> so, you pull up your duvet. <laughs> because then you're safe. I mean, let's face it, nothing stops a chainsaw like a bit of synthetic duck. <laughs> And I hear a gurgling in the night to take a couple of Alka-Seltzers. The planes are the place of greatest fear. The places when suddenly everybody believes in God. It's weird. All the atheists, you're on a plane, oh, I believe in God, I'm sorry. Personally, my religion is love. Because all you need is love. Love is all you need. Basically, I'm desperate for a shame. I was talking before about the government selling off things that we already own. Sometimes it's not possible to work out who owns what. I mean, even the simplest products, there, there are countless interconnections. Everything is owned by somebody. Sadly, most things are owned by the same somebodies. Mars, for instance, own whiskers, for example. Now, what's interesting about that is that despite spending millions convincing us that whiskers is better news to a cat than a vet losing his scissors, and that eight out of ten cats would probably vomit in nauseous disgust if offered anything but whiskers, whiskers also own kitty cat. <laughs> Actually, that's eight out of ten business. That's very interesting because Mars, who own whiskers and kitty cat, have financed their own animal surveys before. They tested chocolate on monkeys. They were fed on a diet of pure sweets to check out how fast their teeth rotted.
Strangely, the results of this research were never published, but I can exclusively reveal that 10 out of 10 monkeys were totally pissed off. <laughs> we have no idea what goes on behind the brand name and what dreadful acts are committed on our behalf. Dulux, for instance, owned by ICI. ICI. Now, we all know about Dulux, don't we? Beautiful Dulux dog. I shouldn't think there's any one of us that hasn't gone, oh, look at that big bundle of fur. Well, ICI were also responsible for the famous smoking beagle experiments, where little dogs chain smoke themselves to death. Maybe ICI should be a bit more honest with their ads. Buy our paint, or we shoot the dog. <laughs> now, I realise that I spend a lot of time taking a mickey out of the good and the great, as they are called. But I am not the only one. Sometimes they do it themselves. As we find out, returning once again to the Neville Chamberlain Awards. Speaking out of one's bum hell is an art. It should be respected. We here in Britain have produced some of the finest anal monologues in the world. I myself have in my hand a piece of paper which proves beyond doubt that Herr Hitler is a tiny, fluffy, wee bunny rabbit of a man who wants nothing more than to be left alone. Well, we'd like to present our first award to Nancy Reagan, a brave woman who has the rare distinction of having actually married a human Neville. In 1984, she said of her husband Ronald, He's got a mind like a computer, like a steel trap. Well, perhaps she's right. Reagan's mind is a bit like a computer, difficult to get working and then only used for playing war games. <laughs> In the long run, of course, computers are no use at all unless a human being is operating them. In this case, Nancy. Doing everything we can. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we should like to present a flake. A flake award. The flake award instigated by a blonde woman sat on the windowsill I talked before about, you know, in a negligee, sweating with an iguana on a telephone. This, this award is presented for the most surprising location on which to nibble a chocolate bar on television. This week, we honour David Dimbleby. Uh, I've got to go to David Dimbleby. In the middle of eating a Mars bar. <laughs> what a sexy beast, eh? A well deserved flake there. <laughs> and that's the Neville Chamberlain Awards for another week. Why is it that we all make such idiots of ourselves the whole time? Why are we all such farters? It's, it's almost as if some malignant presence was there, accompanying us through our lives, messing things up, spoiling things, making things go wrong. It's as if we are all born with an invisible demon. From the cradle to the grave, he or she is always there, screwing up our sad little existences. It's he or she who hides your keys down the back of the sofa. Your invisible demon is with you at the train station as you approach the ticket collector. That's when he gently removes your ticket from the pocket you put it in and puts it in a pocket you have never used before in your life. Oh, where's my ticket? I'm gonna die, I'll send you to prison. Oh, thank God for that. He or she is with you at all times. This man thinks he's alone, but no, his invisible demon is with him. He can't see, but he's there on the pavement with him, messing things up. <laughs> his invisible demon is there, guiding him straight to that one pivoted paving stone with the puddle in the middle. <laughs> and what's this? A dog poo? Can't let that go by. Yes, the invisible demon slips it under his foot. So now, of course, Marty has to search about for one of those three blades of urban greenery that eight million other people have wiped dog poo on before him. And what's this? Somebody approaching Farty on the pavement. The pavement is wide and empty. The other bloke moves to avoid him. Farty watches him. Two seconds later, the invisible demon pulls him the other way. The other bloke tries again. And so they dance towards each other in a suicidal ballet, emulating each other's movements till they eventually nut each other in the face. <laughs> Girls, you're invisible demon. Girls, your invisible demon is with you at all times in the changing room at Topshop, Dorothy Perkins or some other high street fashion emporium. Oh, you're admiring yourself in the mirror, you look good, checking yourself lovely, but when you go out through the curtains, that's when your invisible demon sticks your skirt in a zombie attack. 
Oh, you did look tasty wandering up and down the high street, didn't you, eh? Bum on display for all to see. A nice old lady puts you out the misery. Oh, you're badly adjusted at the back, love. <laughs> She's been in the bank! The grocers! The video shop! The co-op! Why didn't somebody tell her? <laughs> you're an invisible demon. It's with you at all times. You're, it's with you at a dinner party. You're, you're, you're trying to be a bit impressive. You know, maybe it's the, it's the parents of your new lover. It's a dinner party. You want to look cool. But you've got you've to use their loo. And nobody likes using a stranger's loo, do they? You know, especially if you've got the lay one. I mean, you know. <laughs> when you're hoping you're going to store it up and relax at home with the Guardian. But no, no, no. You've got to go. So you go upstairs, you get, you get in the loo, and you, 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 you drape a sheet of paper on the surface of the water to deaden the fall. <laughs> Quite a few people thinking I thought I was the only person in the world. <laughs> Think how I feel, eh? First time I did that gag, it's quite a dangerous job I do here, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, I hope I'm right about this one. <laughs> I'm badging millions of people sat at home going, well, I don't do that, do you do that? <laughs> Sounds a bit weird. Anyway, you lay one in your host's lavvy, right? And you flush it. That's when your invisible demon sticks his hand down the toilet and grabs on the toilet. There's no way he's letting that one go first flush. No, that's going to take two or three pulls with all that disappears. They're all sat downstairs going, is Benji ill or what? And you're upstairs waiting for the cistern to fill. Come on, please fill. Is it full yet? You don't know. Is it full? Is it full? No, I don't think it's full. I don't think it's full. And then suddenly your invisible demon grabs your hand and flushes it. It wasn't full! <laughs> Gotta wait for it to fill up all over again. Is this really what we pay our license fees for? I could buy six Emmanuel videos for less. <laughs> and that's about it. Oh, oh, just a reminder. Electricity shares will be available shortly. Off the back of all good lorries. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Ben Elton. Good night!